Hello, welcome to Time for Change, part one, reflections on the makeup and historical methodological practices in social personality psychology. I'm pleased to have you join us. I organized this session with my colleague, my co-chair, Dr. Neil Lewis Jr., who is hosting part two tomorrow, so please don't miss that. Dr. Lewis and I organized this session um, and part two on Saturday with the idea of a call to action to our colleagues um, in terms of the, the need to improve our methods, as well as our approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we think those are intimately linked needs. So today we're looking back a bit, focusing on the history of our discipline and the methods we have used to develop our knowledge base. We'll begin with Dr. Stephanie Freiberg, member of the Tulalip tribes and a professor at the University of Michigan. She has built a wealth of knowledge on the impact of race, culture, and class on self and well being, and has also developed educational interventions to improve outcomes for racial minority and low income students. Dr. Roger Jainer Soroya is at the University of Kent at Canterbury. He has a broad research program on moral and social emotions and has recently been a champion of transparency in scientific practices. Dr. Helen A. Neville is a professor of, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She is an expert on issues of race, racism, and colorblind ideology. And she is a national and international leader on issues of diversity and equity. And finally, Dr. Sanjay Srivastava is a professor at the University of Oregon. He has a research program focused on impression management, personality development, and emotions. He has also been a leader in the open science movement, emphasizing both me methods and practices that are more open and rig rigorous, as well as more inclusive and just. You're all in for a treat. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget about part two tomorrow. And for now, I'll turn it over to Dr. Freiberg. Hi, my name is Stephanie Freiberg, and I'm here today to reflect on our discipline. I am a social and cultural psychologist, and my reflections today stem from and reflect my experiences in the field. When I take a step back and think about the history of our field, what I see is so much promise. Social and cultural psychology were founded on social justice concerns. As such, we push back against normative ideas of what constitutes good, right and moral human beings. We aim to study and represent the diversity of human functioning. The tools of our science can and importantly have helped us unpack and change social issues. And we have as a field the power to up uplift voices that otherwise are rendered invisible. Yet, despite all that we have to offer, we still have so far to go. We have gatekeepers at every level of our science saying what is good or right without an awareness of the underlying implications or methodological short-sightedness of these approaches. For example, we have known for decades that groups have been left out of our science. Racially minoritized communities, lower SES people, women, LGBTQ plus people, and many other groups. And we have come up with a lot of different ways to justify these exclusions. For example, reviews of my own work show this gatekeeping at play. As one of the few scholars who studies indigenous communities, I have heard the following comments from reviewers. What can we learn from natives? How do we know Native Americans are not simply less intelligent than whites? Or because this experiment was conducted on a reservation, it doesn't involve true random assignment. What we are getting at and what these editors are getting at is there, there's a good or right way to engage science. And if we can't engage the group in these ways, then the, the science doesn't belong in our journals. If we step back and take a bigger look at our field, we're struggling with the fact that our current practices don't align with our founding ideals. So at the most basic level, we continue to uphold good, normal, ideas that are centered around Western educated, industrialized, rich democracies. 
we carry that forward by also overgeneralizing from college samples, by having a, a science and our journals that are filled with studies of college students, and by showing a lack of attention to culture. When we don't attend to culture, we normalize weird peoples and weird ways of being. We also render invisible other people and other ways of being. The result is we narrow our understanding of psychological processes. As a result, we often misunderstand <clears throat> diverse communities and fail to create solutions to real world problems that are culturally relevant or maximally effective. As a result, I would argue our science has not lived up to our founding ideals because we don't have a systemic framework for considering difference. So how can we get back to our core and embrace all that we have to offer? I would argue with, along with my colleagues that we need to build interpretive power. Interpretive power is the ability to understand individuals' behavior in relation to their cultural context. We build interpretive power by recognizing and explicitly acknowledging how cultural context shapes participants' psychological processes. Also by using methodologies that intentionally build upon different perspectives, experiences, and questions. By using and engaging research practices that leverage and support multiple viable and good ways of being. As scientists, oop, I'm sorry, and viewing divergent ideas and findings as generative rather than problematic or deficient. As scientists, we only know what we know. So we must be intentional about leveraging interpretive power. And so when I say we only know what we know, we only have the mental frameworks, the, the cultural models that we carry in our mind from our experiences. We use those models to interpret, to analyze, and to engage. And so in order for us to leverage interpretive power, culture must become a tool that guides these research questions, our designs, and our analysis and interpretation. Cultural differences in psychological processes must shift away from a search for universal or fundamental processes. We must avoid overgeneralizations and specify cultural contexts and populations. As such, cultural processes become the focus rather than group categories. When we do this, we utilize understandings of how culture shapes cognition, motivation, and emotion. We build theories that explain why, how, and when psychological processes manifest differently in diverse contexts. So in my lab, we talk a lot about interpretive power, but as a group, we've come up with essential questions that are needed to build interpretive power. So we think about, do we have the necessary conceptual and methodological tools to conduct research in this context? So that both includes individuals who can represent what we are seeing in the data, as well as a diversity of people who can play an important role in analyzing and assessing what we have learned. Has our methodology our measurement been tested with the population we want to study. And this piece is so important because often measurements are normalized on certain populations. So what does it mean to carry it over into another community? What do I know about the cultural influences in this context? So when we're trying to understand cogn cognition, motivation, emotion, what are the cultural pieces that are driving how these psychological processes play out? How might the psychological processes differ in this population compared to existing research? How have we built a respectful, mutually beneficial connection with the population we want to study? And 
what are our own cultural assumptions or experiences in relationship to this topic. We still have a lot to learn from these projects, and we still have a lot of interpretive power to build. We don't have all the answers, but I want to leave with the idea that building interpretive power can lead us to a better science and can help us to reach those foundational ideals we set out to many years ago. Thank you. My name is Roger Gina Sorolla. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology, a professor of social psychology at the University of Kent in England. And I'm here to participate in this session on the past of social and personality psychology, speaking mostly on social psychology. And of course, 10 years ago was 2011, that year that everything seemed to change. And so I thought I would um, share some insights on how research used to be done or was done pre-2011. And to remind you that not all of those things have gone away and not all of those things that were features of the landscape back then maybe will realistically go away. Um, so I'm gonna focus on three things that stand out from my memories of the pre-2011 landscape before this uh, awareness of reform and of the problems that not having uh, reformed research reporting could bring us. The first one was that you, how you got ahead in careers. You got ahead simply by having positive findings that were interesting. And the thing was, you could be interesting in two different ways. You could be, of course, interesting to a lay audience. You could have findings that made people's jaws drop and um, you, could, uh, you could get media coverage and not just media coverage, but also publication in quite well-regarded journals based on these jaw-dropping findings that usually took the form of you can get a lot behaviorally for a little bit of input, a little bit of activation of some motivation, some construct, um, some prime, call it what you will. And you could also get ahead in the field by, by having a theory, by having a theory that was identified with yourself and having findings that supported that theory again and again and again, and if somebody had findings that didn't support your theory, you then kind of had a very genteel um, discussion with them, or maybe just ignored them on uh, you know, how you were wrong and how my theory is correct and you're not doing it right. And, but most of the times people just stuck in, to their own theory, built their own monument, as I like to say. And um, that was another way, but that also meant that both of these kinds of research also meant that you were very invested in things coming out in one particular way. And this is especially true because of the second feature I want to bring up, which is that there were heuristics for quality of findings in a paper. And those heuristics, I think, were bad. They were um, not very accurate, and they led to perverse incentives of hiding research and uh, brushing studies under the rug. Um, but the heuristic I'm speaking of was just the idea that each and every study in your paper has to have some significant result that supports your hypothesis. And of course, if you run many studies, even if you're studying something that's true, you're going to get things that are not significant, but those were not encouraged to be reported. Editors would tell you, just leave that aside. Um, and if you submitted a paper with half significant findings and half findings leaning in that direction, but not significant. The paper was probably getting rejected. And there were also heuristics for careers. How many publications do you have? Where are those publications? There was a kind of internal mathematics where uh, you know, one JPSP was worth, I don't know how many JESPs. Uh, I'm not gonna speculate on that, but uh, you know, people weighed up your career based on these publications and they were very cut and dried um, ways of doing that. But then the third feature of research pre-2011, and I look back on this with a little bit of bittersweetness, we trusted each other. So we could show up to a conference and see somebody like Diedrich Stoppel giving a talk 
And I had this experience when I was at a pre-conference at SPSB uh, where I saw him giving a talk and he presented data that are actually quite similar to uh, in, in method to some data we'd actually published previously, but the, finding the complete opposite results. And we'd um, you know, found things that surprised us, surprised us, we didn't think we'd found, he'd found things that were yeah, completely in line with what you would think. And I thought, well, that's weird. Uh, I guess his participants must have been different, uh, being Dutch as opposed to our English, uh, British participants. And uh, indeed his participants were very different, uh, but I never thought to think maybe he's making this up. And we might, those of you who've been around a while might've had these experiences as well, where you saw something that looked off, looked a little too good to be true and just trusted uh, the person. I don't think we have that trust 100% anymore. So how things are now, um, have things changed somewhat? You can have, um, you, have, you can have a, still a career is built on saying something. I know lots of people say it's important to replicate or to try to investigate findings that don't look quite reliable. And some people do make a career out of those, but it's not a mainstream way to go. And a lot of times people simply don't have time to participate in this activity of helping science to self-correct. And I think the one thing that has changed is there's more skepticism about people who pursue these wild claims. I think there's more of a focus now on things that seem a little more straightforward, like moral psychology is big. And a lot of that is built on just very straightforward cognitive mechanisms, affective mechanisms, structures that are functional and have a clear function in getting people to watch their own behavior and, and make judgments about the behavior of other people. Um, so a lot of this little bit in, whole lot out, kind of research is falling under skepticism to the point where you probably are going to have a harder time publishing something, making those kinds of claims. It's something that makes a claim that's a little bit more um, intuitive. And I think that's, that's completely defensible uh, from the point of view of what our p-values mean. And our p-values, we can have more trust in a p-value if you know the kind of Bayesian or inferential background of the p-value if you're studying something that isn't a complete long shot, that isn't a one in 10 or one in 100 long shot, but it has a quite reasonable theory behind it. Um, in terms of heuristics, uh, I think, uh, especially thanks to the efforts of other journal editors, uh, some of my own efforts at JSP, we have a smarter way of dealing with p-values. And I think we now know to look at the accumulation of evidence uh, when judging a set of studies. And I think just that in addition to the p-value heuristic, we now have additional heuristics that are added up and weighed up. Things like, is this a powerful study? Is it well-powered? Is, is there a good sample size? And those heuristics have, of course, their own pitfalls if you don't thoroughly understand these concepts. You might say, this study doesn't have 200 people, it's worthless without realizing, well, it's repeated measures and it actually gets a lot of power from those 50 participants. Or um, you may even speak of, oh, this study has low power, but really power is meaningless without having a target effect size. And unless you really know what you're talking about as far as the effect size you uh, expect, then these hard and fast guidelines regarding power are also difficult to enforce as well. And do we have trust these days? It seems to depend. Um, I think we trust people the more they show um, openness, the more they show they have statements that they've reported everything, that they have pre-registrations, uh, showing that they plan their analysis ahead of time. And there's definitely uh, a social division into uh, the open science camp, people who go to open science conferences and publish on this, um, and, uh, and other people who are vocally against open science. But then I think what gives me uh, some reason for hope is that most of the people I talk to who are in neither of these camps still 
gets it. They get the basic idea that research was fast and loose back in the days. And some of the things, some of the, some of the procedures we now have instituted can help to get the research on a more reliable track, a more reliable footing. And so I, I think uh, just going forward into the future, uh, as my time runs out here, I'm just gonna say that um, a lot of the things that I've talked about, those three things about research pre-2011, in some ways, they're not going to completely go away. Uh, you're still going to make a career by showing something rather than nothing, unless that nothing is, is a something that a lot of other people believe in. So there's still some room for the uh, debunker, uh, for the person who says it's not necessarily so to the general public or to people with a, with a very uh, strongly promoted theory. Um, but the people who really check the fine print and the details, we're going to need to think about rewarding that kind of activity more affirmatively because it's not part of the natural self-rewarding work of science. And at JASP, we rarely get any more than 10 replication studies a year out of 700 or so manuscripts, even though uh, we are completely open to replication attempts. And, you know, the other things, heuristics, we still are going to need heuristics. A lot of people say uh, people should use their own judgment in selecting uh, uh, effect sizes or selecting uh, p-values. But if everyone chooses their own, we can't talk about evidence. We can't talk about what is true or degrees of reliability and truth in our, in our studies. And then the science just becomes a matter of, I believe this, well, I believe this other thing. <clears throat> and so I think we are going to need to use heuristics, just smarter heuristics going forward. And finally, uh, trust, we're always going to need trust. It would be very oppressive to live in a discipline where we were constantly monitored and suspected of fraud. And what we we have to trust and verify, as Ronald Reagan used to say, uh, we have to uh, we have to make sure that we put our cards on the table so this trust is not just granted but earned going forward from the year 2011. So thank you for listening and I'll be available in the interactive session to take questions, uh, comments, and be more of a comment than a question kind of thing. Hi, my name is Helen Neville and I'm at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in Ed Psych in African-American Studies. I'm a counseling psychologist. I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of external validity as a way to tend to the current times that we're in and address some of the social issues that we're um, dealing with. First, I'd like to begin with a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois from his 1940 Dusk of Dawn autobiography. And in this, he talks about one could not be a calm, cool, and detached scientist while Negroes were lynched, murdered, and starved. And here he clearly highlights the importance of social scientists to contribute what they can to end suffering and address inequality. And as many of us know, Dr. Du Bois is the considered the founding father of, empiric, of modern empirical sociology. What we're gonna talk about today is how do we select our research topic and approach to investigating that particular topic. And the reason why that's important, when we think about tending to the times, it's important that we are aware of the current moment, about the social conditions of the current moment, and the ways in which psychology can contribute to easing suffering. Uh, I will also tell the tale of two research agendas where I'll be focusing on two areas of work, colorblind racial ideology and radical healing and hope. Selecting a research topic, this is so important. I remember how important it was for me as a grad student. How is it that we go about selecting the topic and why do we select that particular topic? 
for many, when I ask students, what are you interested in? Why, how are you going to identify your dissertation topic? Many times people go into the literature, they identify existing theories in psychology primarily that are related to the general broad area that they're interested in. And they begin to identify gaps in the literature, really thinking this is a top down approach where knowledge is centered within the academy. There's there's also a bottom up approach where knowledge is centered within communities and within people themselves, where we talk to community members and we talk to people to see what's important and how they interpret their lived experience. So they're serving as consultants and experts. And, this, um, and then in addition to that, turning to the interdisciplinary uh, research to figure out what psychology role and where we fit and how we can complement uh, the work. The last piece is why, why are we doing the kinds of work that we're doing? Does the research address the broader goal of working toward promoting aspects of psychology that involve solutions to the fundamental problems of human justice and equitable and fair treatment of all segments of society? I really personally believe that we should use psychological science to help those that are most marginalized because once we help those that are most marginalized, we help everybody in society. I'll focus a bit on telling the tale of two research agendas. And this is a way of uh, reflection. Ideally, I wish I was doing research that was bottom up, um, but in reality, I think I'm doing research that's in the middle, in the middle up. Why do I do what I do as an African-American um, social scientist and black studies scholar? I want to intervene to make a difference in alleviating uh, pain and suffering, in eradicating racism and promoting joy and hope and tapping into our sense of joy and resiliency. That's kind of, and so at this particular moment, the ways in which racism is showing up is through the killing and extra, uh, extrajudicial killings of black and brown folks, is through the disproportionate number of people who have uh, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people who have contracted uh, COVID and who are dying from COVID because of inequalities in our social, economic, and healthcare systems. So how did I get interested in this idea of colorblind racial ideology? I was actually working on this in the 90s when I taught a course uh, multicultural issues in counseling cores. And every year my students would tell me, oh my goodness, this, I get racism now. I see it everywhere. I see it in my family. I see it on TV. Um, and this course helped me to unpack that. And I then began to realize that that's a phenomena. So I turned to my scholar friends that were in political science, history, sociology, black studies, and began to say, well, what is this phenomena? And they introduced me to the term of colorblindness, racial colorblindness. And this was really before psychologists were immersed and social scientists were immersed into the topic. And so that's how I found the topic. I was um, interested in, based on my interdisciplinary uh, examination and my observation, I was interested in what now I know from Ruth Frankenberg's work is power evasion. So she talks about colorblind racial ideology as consisting of two key components, color evasion, which is this denial of race. I don't see what race you are. Um, and people see this as a strategy to reduce prejudice. And the alternative to that is multiculturalism. And a lot of psychologists and social psychologists approach colorblind racial ideology from this particular frame. I'm interested in the power evasion side in which it's the denial, um, minimization and distortion of racism, the institutional racism piece of it. And what this ideology does is it serves um, to justify the status quo. We now call it a legitimizing ideology. 
And the alternative approach to that is to adopt a color conscious approach. Well, why does it even matter? Why should we differentiate between these two concepts? Well, after um, uh, my colleagues and I uh, developed a scale, the colorblind racial attitude scale, and we've been doing research and other people have been doing research um, using the scale um, for the past 20 years. And what we have found is that those individuals who deny, distort, and minimize the existence of institutional racism have higher levels of racial prejudice, racial fear, um, they're more tolerant of microaggressions, and they also have lower levels of ethnocultural empathy, social justice beliefs, and multicultural competencies. So what that means, um, we have data to suggest, what that means is if people deny racism, they are less sensitive to uh, clients when they see clients, or if they're teachers, they're less sensitive to their uh, black, indigenous, and people of color students. So this has real implications for the lived experiences of folks. It also relates to voting, um, voting uh, behavior, a support of affirmative action. So while we're not changing structures per se, we are changing individual and group behaviors and thinking, which inevitably uh, contributes to changing structures. I'm super excited to be working with Jackie Yi, uh, Nathan Todd, and Yara Makawi on a meta-analysis that uh, for this particular meta-analysis, we have 154 studies and we looked at power evasion uh, and compared it to uh, color evasion on some of the indicators that we have enough data because, um, uh, because most of the color evasion research is looking at it from an experimental design, but there are still some that use a correlational study. And so what we have found is that um, um, power evasion is related to higher levels of anti-Black prejudice, higher levels of legitimizing ideologies, and, high, and lower levels of race-related social justice behaviors as we might expect. Whereas those aren't related for when people just deny the, that somebody denies somebody's race. I wanted to briefly talk to you about some other research I became interested in. And the reason why this matters is because it moves again from personal observations or experience to building out to something that could resonate with other folks, which is what we should be doing as researchers. Our research should be meaningful. It should have that sense of external validity. Living abroad in Tanzania, had me realize I felt great, I felt wonderful. And the reason why I felt so wonderful is that I wasn't dealing with racism. Um, and so when I returned to the States, I was fortunate enough to have been elected a Division 45 president. And part of my presidential initiative was to look at this idea of promoting healing through social justice, focusing on black, indigenous, and people of color healing. Um, working with a wonderful team, Brianna French, Gioni Lewis, Della Mosley, Hector Adames, uh, Nayeli Chavez Duenas, um, and Grace Chen, we developed a radical healing model that uh, looked at various different components of healing that was focusing on individual healing, as well as a notion of collective healing. Um, uh, I say this just to say, um, it seems to be resonating with folks. The work has been out for a little over a year and it's had like 10 or 15,000 downloads. Um, that's not to um, overemphasize that, but it's just to communicate that for some it's resonating. What we're hearing from people of color is that it is a model that taps into um, how they, their worldview and how they see the world. What we are doing now in terms of the research piece is honing in on the concept of radical hope first, um, problematizing the ways in which hope has traditionally been looked at in the literature where it has focused on individual and future behavior. Now we're talking about a sense of collective uh, well being that looks both at the future as well as the past and takes into consideration individual 
and collective orientation. We have gathered focus group data, individual data, and now we are in the process of developing a measure of radical hope to begin to assess that with the ultimate goal of seeing if it's associated with well-being indicators and then developing a, um, a intervention to promote radical hope. So tending to this times, I wanted us to focus on interrogating why you're doing the research that you're doing, exploring ways to increase external validity as it relates to exper experiential realities and finding meaning in your journey. Thank you. Hi, thanks for watching. And thanks to the organizers, Kate McLean and Neil Lewis Jr. for inviting me today. I'd like to use my time to talk about the open science movement in psychology, two sets of priorities that underpin it, how they relate to each other, and where we are today. This year marks the 10th anniversary of a watershed year in psychology. A series of events in 2011 began a period that some came to call the replication crisis in psychology. One of those events was the publication of Daryl Bem's article, Feeling the Future, which presented nine experiments that purported to show strong evidence for something impossible, extrasensory perception, or ESP. I remember very well the chatter that was happening around that time uh, when the paper was circulating. Many people assumed that there had to be one big error that ran through all the studies, something like a confound, a failure of blinding, or something like that. But nobody could find that one thread to pull on and make it all unravel. Instead, it appeared to be business as usual. Later that year, Simmons et al.'s paper, False Positive Psychology, came out, demonstrating that common practices that people either didn't know were a problem or thought were sort of small fudges accommodating the messy realities of real-world research, that these things could actually combine to produce large distortions in results. The coming years saw revelations that the body of findings deemed important and influential might not be as reliable as people thought, that some of those common practices were actually occurring out in the wild. As psychology turned inward and tried to diagnose what was going on, a major part of the diagnosis became a lack of transparency. So for example, researchers might try many different analyses, but when it comes time to read the report about the research, the journal article would only include the ones that quote-unquote worked, that supported a hypothesis or a clean story, a practice called p-hacking. Researchers might look at the data and come up with a compelling story that would have explained it, but when they present the idea and the evidence, they reverse the order, so it seems like the evidence was confirmation of an a priori hypothesis, a practice called harking. Or researchers might run lots and lots of studies that show all kinds of results, but journals are only interested in publishing things that are exciting or new or positive or significant. And so as a result, what we read in journals is a selected and biased subset of what we're actually finding out in our labs, a process called publication bias. The reason this intersects with openness is that when science works well, it works well as a social system. Researchers read and critique each other's work, they vet each other's findings, and they hold each other accountable for drawing conclusions that follow from all of the evidence. And psychologists realized that we needed access to more information to be able to do this well, to collectively produce credible and useful and valid results. And so this leads to the first rationale for open science, the idea that openness is good for science, for the system of science. That's been a large part of how openness has been talked about within psychology. But psychology didn't invent the open science movement, and different rationales, different perspectives precede our field and have been happening in parallel to our discussion. There's another view that treats knowledge, including scientific knowledge, as something that's a common good. The idea here is that everyone should have access to scientific knowledge and to be able to benefit from it, and everyone should have an opportunity to do science that addresses their values, concerns, and priorities in those of their communities. This is why, for example, librarians have been such champions and allies of open science. Giving people access to knowledge is a core value for many of them. So the idea that cancer patients should be able to read clinical trials, 
or that the people in community-based research should be able to read what was learned from their participation is what drives many advocates of open access, open science, and open scholarship more broadly. And so this leads into a second rationale, whereas in the first case it was inward-looking about openness being good inside of the institution of science, this second sense is about openness being good for the connection between society and science, for openness making science good for society. And if you think carefully and critically about the second sense, you'll realize that it's not very meaningful unless you start thinking about things like inclusion, equity, access, and justice. You cannot fully engage with the question of science benefiting people without asking, benefiting who? And so feminist open scientists like Denise Albernoz or Madeline Pownall and colleagues have pressed us to ask questions like, open to who? Who actually has access to scientific knowledge? Who has the resources and career stability to act on that knowledge? Who stands to gain from making something open? So these two perspectives, these inward looking and outward looking perspectives are ones that quite frankly, when I talk to people, I think most people in psychology at the outside, at least initially, will tend to endorse both of them. But people have different ideas about how they're related to each other. So at times, especially earlier in psychology's open science days, I would sometimes encounter people who would think that first sense would just sort of naturally lead to the second sense. It's kind of the field of dreams theory of openness. If you open it, they will come. That if we do things that are good inside the existing mechanisms of science, well, that's good for everyone else too. But for reasons I already discussed, I think that's a pretty limited perspective. And honestly, I encounter fewer and fewer people endorsing it, which makes me think that that's been a broader realization. A second perspective is that these two senses of openness are in some kind of tension or that there's a trade-off. You only have so much time and resources, so should you focus on strengthening the institutions of science or should you focus on reaching out to others? At the limits, this is probably true in at least some instances, but I think it's dangerous to rush to it too quickly. In particular, if you're already well served by the status quo, it's pretty easy to just sort of jump on this and say, well, we shouldn't even try to reach out to, to people or broaden science or make it more inclusive. We should at least be pushing ourselves to think if that's necessarily the case. And so this brings me to the third perspective, the one that I have the most sympathy for and find myself most in agreement with, the idea that these two senses of openness can be brought into alignment if we pay active attention and make an effort to. We can build open science systems to be diverse, inclusive, and just from the inception. The broad values of openness have to be turned into specific implementations, and people have a tendency to produce implementations that work for the use cases they know, themselves, and the people like them. And so this means that we need to be doing open science in a way that has lots and lots of different people with different concerns, different needs, different priorities in the room at the beginning, so we can create systems that work for as many people as possible, rather than treating inclusion as something to be slapped on later in an update. I think what this suggests is that, at its worst, people acting in the name of open science might do things that reinforce existing power structures, even just out of ignorance. They'll create, if, the, if the powerful and privileged are the ones creating solutions, they'll create solutions that work for the powerful and privileged. This is quite honestly how lots of institutions in science preceding the open science movement have been created going back pretty much forever. And there's no guarantee that as, the, as science is transforming itself to be more open, it won't do the same things. But I think at its best, open science has tremendous potential to challenge and disrupt power. That's because power sustains itself by controlling information, which is in opposition to openness, or at least a broad sense of openness. Who gets to know that some famous experiment doesn't hold up and they shouldn't bother trying to build on it? Once upon a time, the way you found out was by being friends with people and getting invited to the conference hotel bar, because replications were communicated through gossip instead of through journals where everyone could read about them? Who gets to know what it takes behind the scenes to actually produce an effect, as when protocols and materials and analytic practices were guarded as lab secrets? 
Who gets to know about all the failed starts and dead ends, as opposed to the clean and polished story that gets published in the journal? Power is what determines a lot of these things. And perhaps even more than determining who knows things, power can affect who controls what knowledge gets produced. Who are the people that get studied in psychology? Whose problems are deemed important enough to solve? Whose theories and ideas get to see the light of day and get taken seriously? One thing is clear. Open science is not going away. The sciences are in the middle of a transition, not the end of it, and things are going to keep changing for many years, whether you like it or not. The long history of power systems reproducing themselves in every facet of society, including in science, is a reason for concern. But when I look at who is doing the work of open science, not just the big names that might be the first to come into your head, but who's actually in the trenches creating new solutions, remaking the field into how it's going to be in the future, it's a group of people that tend to be young, diverse, and spread outside of power centers. This is something that gives me reason for hope. But the organizers have told me that the discussion of the future is tomorrow's panel. I'm supposed to be talking about the past, so I guess I'll stop there. Thanks for watching.